boys and girls so i hope that uh, you are able to develop a clear understanding based on the last two lectures over the topic uh, of discussion transient responses so under the head of this topic we are continuing our discussions to work out the transient response and the steady state response of the given electrical circuit typically the first order circuit most of the time we consider as an example and uh, the influence of the switching network or influence of the switching conditions over the electrical network that how the switching conditions are impacting over the electrical or electronic network circuits okay so in continuation to that lecture in that series today we have a last lecture and today we are going to deal with the little typical conditions like the sinusoidal sources we are going to consider the influence of non sinusoidal sources and at the same time we are going to consider little higher degree of the order of the circuit that is the second order circuit because you know that though the first order circuit is a highly linear in nature okay is one of the most widely used applications but the more um, second order systems has much more applications finding its more application than that of the first order system in as far as the real life scenarios are concerned reason is that it's a combination of linearity and the non linearity or you can say that it's the verge of non linearity or the non linearity is just about to start so you must have study about the piecewise model of uh, any diode circuit there you might have seen that how a non linear curve that means a exponential curve or parabolic curve can be divided in two pieces and can be controlled in a segregated manner as a linear circuit so that is a different uh, mode of discussions at the device level engineering and here we restrict ourselves to the circuit level engineering itself so therefore today we are going to consider under the head of our discussion a second order differential equation and that means uh, in terms of physical realization we are going to consider a combination of rlc network all because many times you might have seen that there is a combination of rl circuit rlc circuit or rc circuit so here in this case particularly we are going to consider the combination of rlc circuit which for ultimately can be realized only with the help of a second order auxiliary equations or what you call the second order differential equations if you are going to write down the characteristic equation of the physical physically uh, model the physical model or the electrical circuit so to continue our discussions here we consider a second order auxiliary equation so obviously one more coefficient is now going to enhance rather than a0 a1 so now here we are going to consider a0 as a coefficient of a second order term a1 is a coefficient of first order term and a2 is a coefficient of the zero order term okay you can reverse it depending on your understanding okay and from there we are assuming that the source voltage is given driven in terms of the source voltage and the response you are going to derive in terms of the current so when you are going to write down this equation you know that any second order equation is depends on the uh, valuation factor that is root over of a square minus 4 uh, a not a2 as far as our auxiliary equation is concerned and there instantaneous value of current can be driven with the two coefficients a1 is to s20 plus k2 is to s2d now the value of s1 s2 and the value of k1 k2 is going to supposed to decide the location of the roots of the polynomial if this uh, factor uh, that is root over of a1 square uh, minus 4a not a2 is uh, equal to 0 then that is typically we called the uh, critical solutions if you are going to typically get the less than zero then you will get the imaginary pair of the solution if you are getting greater than zero then you are getting the two real roots now the two real roots are the indication of the overshoot in the network so that means if the things are not going to control if these coefficients are not going to control or if the coefficient value the constants k1 and k2 is not going to control then sooner the circuit may lead to the unstable zone so that means the system will be out of your controls not very good applications the electronic circuit like the oscillators uh, has a beautiful example over this overshoot conditions otherwise most of the real life scenario whatever you see around 98% application is drawn under the head of the undershoot condition or the under damped condition what we call it clear the overshoot or over, so over damped is the two different thing overshoot is the highest magnitude during the oscillations Okay, so the real roots will give you the over damped conditions imaginary roots will give you the under damped conditions and the zero will get the critically damped condition which is again almost the ideal scenario at all depending on the damping factor that we will discuss in the 
next stage. Now, this auxiliary equation can be compared with the model is given below, where our source voltage is there. Again, the switch is used to separate with the rest of the electrical component, and a combination of RLC circuit is given of the value of 3 ohm, 1 Henry, and the half of the farad as an example. Now, at the time t is equal to 0, we apply the switching condition. So, from there, we can write down our standard equation and we can represent it in terms of. Uh, S domain, S domain that means here is the frequency domain and remember whenever we talk about the network analysis and synthesis as far as any S domain is concerned we by default always considered as a Laplacian domain, okay. Uh, do you think that, uh, uh, do you able to answer that why we consider the Laplace transformation not the Fourier transformation here though you might have seen the application of Laplace transformation and Fourier transformation in the different heads of engineering in the widespread applications area but we need to develop a clear understanding that, that in what circumstances you should apply a Laplace transformation and in which circumstances you should apply the Fourier transformations think about it so as you can appreciate that in this second order equation where here is s is equal to replaced by e raised to st what do you have uh, your answer? Why Laplace? Why not Fourier? See, the classical difference is both are falling on the S domain, that is the frequency domain. And we know that the time and frequency there, these are the only two fundamental domains are available. Rest all is kind of transformation technique is either developed based on one of the pattern of philosophy of the Laplace or Fourier one. So, when to use Fourier and when to refer Laplace transformation, correct. So, therefore, here you can see that if the value of S is equal to sigma plus J omega, that means sigma is representing the real participation of the real elements, the real term that is the resistive network, the resistive elements and j omega is basically imaginary term so it is representing the participation of the reactive elements right this may be an inductive may be capacitive may be a combination of both so if sigma is equal to zero or sigma is tending to zero what does it mean so that means the influence of resistance over the that given electrical or electronic network is almost negligible it is as good as you can say that it is a resistance loss less so that means in other words you can say that it is a lossless there will be no power dissipation if there is no resistance, right? So where in Laplace, we replace the S, that is the S plane or S domain with sigma plus J omega, whereas in Fourier, we replace S is equal to J omega. So that means whenever we apply Fourier transformation, you assume or you can only apply the Fourier transformation in the relevant applications where you can justify that the impact of sigma is tending to zero for example communication system entire telecommunication system is based on the Fourier's philosophy whereas whenever you consider the networks electrical networks or the process industries or the power generation plants in these scenarios we consider the laplace transformation because you cannot made establish any physical systems which is a completely lossless that means where the dissipation of power is zero Right? So that's the classical difference, that's the fundamental difference between the Fourier transformation and Laplace transformation. Okay, it depends on application area where to use either Fourier transformation or Laplace transformation. Invariably, you cannot use both the transformation for the same purpose. So that's not possible. Okay, so let us come back to our reward discussion. If you refer the equation number one, and if you compare it with the standard equation, now you are getting k1 e raised to minus t plus k2 e raised to minus 2t. You can apply the switching condition at t is equal to zero. You that I0 plus is equal to 0 because it has a single mesh. So, therefore, rate of the change of current di by dt will be also 0. Okay. So, from there, sorry, it is a non homogeneous equation. So, it is equal to non zero value. So, it is V by L. Okay. So, it is 1 ampere second. And then, if you are going to refer the uh, substitute these values. So, from there, you can get the value of uh, K1 and K2 because you have two standard equations to unknown uh, constants. Uh, so you can work it out. So therefore, I1 is equal to e raised to minus t minus e raised to minus. So I don't find think that you'll find any difficulty. I would advise you at this stage that you try to plot this particular response either using MATLAB or maybe you can do some. See this particular graph. You see e raised to minus t is a positive term. 
e raised to minus t is negative, but plus 1 into e raised to minus t. So it is a rate of decline, right? And minus of e raised to minus 20. So it's a phase reversal you are getting. So in an opposite phase, again with the magnitude of minus multiply by minus 1, so you are getting e raised to minus minus of minus e raised to 20. So you are getting a water image of that. So what it justifies that the system is uh, supposed to be over damped. So that means the system is going to be over response if you see on the graph the combination of e raised to minus 2 e raised to minus 2 t says that system is reaching very fast to the stable uh, to steady state one but it may leads to unstable zone if you are not going to take proper care of the components and variables. Right? Some other applications are also given like now our model equation is given so you can apply your theory and work it out. Let us compare the characteristics variably um, the use of number of resistances in terms of capacitance. So one thing we are assuming that we are going to consider a second order characteristic equation. So if you are going to consider a second order characteristic equation, you might have noticed that the two roots uh, S1, S2, what you are getting that is minus sigma j um, omega n, uh, zeta omega n plus minus j omega n root over 1 minus zeta square. Now if you look at the second terms, that imaginary term j omega n root over 1 minus zeta square, okay, because j is a basically imaginary plane, okay. So what is omega n? Natural frequency. The frequency where your whole system, the entire circuit is tuned, okay, or is operating. That frequency, that is the your natural frequency. So it is omega n radian per second, okay. Zeta is the damping ratio. What is the damping ratio? It is the difference between the damped frequency and the sorry, ratio of the damped frequency and the undamped frequencies, right? So zeta decides that zeta plays a very critical role in the rate of change of the slopes. Okay, how fast or how slow your system should be stable or leads to the unstable zone. Point to be noted. So therefore, in brief, we can write it like that. Uh, the two roots are falling S1, S2 minus theta omega n plus minus j omega d. So omega d is the damped frequency, right? It is kept on damp, right? And what is what is the what your theta omega? So this is basically nothing but it is one upon time constant. So this side. Okay, if this factor is very high, so that means time constant will be low. T is equal to one upon theta omega n. T will be very very low. If T is very low, so that means the rate of change the system will uh, circuit will attain very fast recovery. Yeah, otherwise it will be slow. Rest, as you see that you can have a, either combination of an underdamped system where you will get the complex conjugate pair. Either you have a critical system where you are getting two negative roots or of the two value equal value and there are two negative roots but the unequal value like in previous example we said that is a over damped system. Critically damped is typically you can have a less than 1% application. It is almost close to the ideal thing. Okay, So practically it is not possible. So therefore in real life scenario 99% time, 0.2% time you will get either under damped application, any, any circuit is typically most of the time is under damped, okay, because you never want willing to you that your circuit or your system should lead to be the unstable zone, you always wanted to keep it stable irrespective of the circumstances, right, otherwise your system or circuit is supposed to be uncontrolled, okay, but as far as, as I said that over time also has some limited applications like oscillator is a beautiful example of the over damped response. Okay. Whereas the amplifier filters, these are an example of the under damped system. Okay. Continue our discussion in further. So to give a better understanding of the imaginary S plane or the Laplacian plane, Laplacian domain over the S plane or S domain, here we have tried to uh, define that uh, you see in the last uh, presentation, we find out the two roots based on the second order characteristic equation S1, S2 and it is falling as minus zeta omega n plus minus j omega n root over 1 minus zeta square. So remember you are getting a negative terms that means you are always falling at the left half of the S plane. Okay. As far as the S plane is concerned at the later stage when you will sub study the subjects like a control system you will be able to develop a better understanding that how the system can be evaluated in the frequency domain. Okay, whether the stable system can be practically usable or not. That means the mathematical model we are doing that can be actually realizable in practice or not. Not Otherwise, you cannot have that kind of circuit. And even you will make it, it cannot exist last long. Okay, it, can, it can't be practically usable. It cannot be reliable. 
Okay, so therefore to under and analyze that, that whether the system is controllable or not, we used to do this analysis as plane analysis where you have a unit circle. Okay, we have a two planes, the negative half and positive half. Remember, positive half is always leads to the unstable. So whatever your number of roots, like in this case, in second order differential equation, we have two roots S1 and S2, both should fall in the left half of the S plane within the unit circle. So where the zeta is equal to 1 is mentioned, that is called the position of the critically damped system. You have a two real roots of the equal value. So they are falling over one over other. Fine. So it is just as good as like that you have a single suit and there are two occupants. Is it practically possible that they both will be settled down over the single set for the long duration of time? Practically not. One will always try to throw it down the other. Okay. That is exactly what happened with the two real roots of the equal values. Fine. It is just like as good as that there are two persons but one seat. So both cannot be accommodated over the same seat at the same time. That's why the critical damping is impossible to achieve. Fine. It is just as good as that you have to attain the infinite rate of change with no time. So practically that is not possible. Fine. Rest of the two cases are the over damped and under damped. Now what we get? the uh, uh, magnitude in case of that under damped system that is uh, minus zeta so two roots are calling it minus sigma plus minus j omega so here the sigma is equal to zeta into omega n okay the real component fine and the magnitude is negative so is phase shift so in the minus x axis that is in the minus sigma axis you can say that you can find that magnitude value is zeta into omega n now what is the imaginary term that is j omega n root over 1 minus zeta square. So j is your vertical plane, imaginary plane. And what is the magnitude? Omega d. Omega d is the damped frequency. And how is, the, is that it has related with natural frequency? So damped frequency is root over 1 minus zeta square times of the natural frequency. Understand? So at any given point of time, if the value of zeta is equal to 1, so what will happen? This whole term will be tending to zeros. That's why in critically damped, you are getting two real roots of the equal value. Understand? In case of over damped, what happened? Again, zeta cannot be exceed to more than one. Okay? So you are getting what kind of response? That you are getting negative of that. Okay? So that's why you are getting the real root. Now, in case of under damped, what happened? That is again factor is root over one minus zeta square. If zeta is less than one, so say for example, it is 0 0.8. So zero square of the 0 0.8 is again always less than 1. So that means 1 minus theta square will always a positive term. So root over of that positive is again a positive term. Right? So that's why you are getting a incremental in the vertical axis. Okay? Depending on the magnitudes and that magnitude will be omega n into root over 1 minus theta square. So it is circularly changed. So in the vertical axis you can see where the zeta is equal to 0. If zeta is equal to 0 then what is the magnitude? Damped frequency is equal to natural frequency. So that means to attain some kind of damping so that with time your system should will keep on damping. It will be keep on losing its certain amount of energy and after every oscillation it is keep on in losing some energy and therefore after certain time your system is going to be finally settled down. That is the signature of a stable system. A stable system should always a, is always a under damped system. It cannot be an over damped system. Okay. So when zeta is equal to 0, it's an undamped system because omega n is equal to omega d. There is a no difference between damped frequency and the natural frequency. Actually, there is absolutely no damping at all. So that's why if zeta is equal to 0, then that condition is called the undamped system or naturally damped system. There is no damping at all, undamped. Okay. There is no damping. If zeta is equal to 1, then that is called the critically damped. And remember, value of zeta cannot exceed these two limits. It is in any circumstances more than or equal to zero. At the same time, it will be maximum limit is less than or equal to one. So zeta is equal to one is represent the critical time, which is an ideal scenario we cannot achieve. So what will happen? Your zeta will always practically vary between zero to one. If it is a zero, so it is lying over the vertical half of the S plane. Okay. And then that factor is equal to your how much magnitude is equal to zeta. Okay, and then if it is actually 1, so you see that it is crossing at the real line that is of the minus sigma plane, okay, minus x plane, you know, understanding, to have a better understanding, you can say, okay, and if it is crossing even that limit further, that means outside of that particular plane, then use zeta is tending to infinite, again, practically cannot be realizable. 
So between those two curves, when where theta is equal to zero and where theta is equal to one, you see you can theta is keep on varying, and this system is under damp. Where the theta is tending towards one, the settlement rate will be the faster. Okay. Typically, if you see the real life application, most of the time the value of theta is typically varying from around 0.5 to here the higher side is around 0.8, 0.9. Hope that you are able to develop the understanding in this regard. Still, if you have any doubt, you can uh, don't hesitate to interrupt me in the next series of lecture. Okay. So, the continuation of this uh, pro problem, uh, as I said, that you can attempt to repeat the similar kind of exercises like this problem. You have given one LR or RL circuit, but now the source is a sinusoidal source. It is V sine omega t uh, omega n plus theta. Okay. So, I hope that you will be able to solve this particular problem and try to attempt. Certain some uh, more um, unsolved problem from the chapter number four, five, and six are highlighted from the book of Balkenberg. I advise you to go through uh, that particular book and try to solve those problems. Remember, those all are the real life problems. You will have a better understanding on that. Okay, so it's not uh, there is absolutely no requirement of cramming the things. Okay, it's a completely mathematics. Okay, and if you, you can develop an understanding, you you can definitely go through. You can even definitely enjoy this particular subject. Again, one more demonstration is there. If you look at this particular slide, uh, in the left half of the slide, we consider a source as an exponentially reducing source that is V into e raised to minus alpha t. So you can consider the same problem RL circuit, but now the source is non sinusoidal source that is V into e raised to minus alpha t. So I would advise you to re exercise again with this combination and try to find out the solution that if the source is exponentially reducing. With the time, then what kind of impact it will put over the same system? Okay, so now remember you have a same RL circuit with a DC source, with a sinusoidal AC source, and then there are non-sinusoidal source. So you try to see the impact over it. Okay, I hope that probably you can take even two minutes of time and uh, try to solve it. If you finding any difficulty, we will uh, discuss. Otherwise, we will conclude the difference between these three and we will move on. As an example, uh, we can demonstrate a RLC circuit and uh, you can apply the Laplace transformation. That is the another way of solution as you have seen that you can apply, you can solve the same problem. You can analyze the same circuit, same electrical electronic circuit uh, in time domain. The last time we exercise or you can use the frequency domain. You can have the Laplace transformation and then you can solve it. Okay, So it is an inductance. It is a basically a uh, first order differential network so it is s of i s minus i of 0 0 minus that means the past value if you have any charged value then r is a uh, real element um, um, passive real passive element so it is r of i s and c is another um, reactive element because you are getting the integration of the, the quantity so um, dimension so therefore it is i of s by s plus uh, the squared amount of form energy in form of charge, so that is Q zero minus uh, S zero minus. Remember, is the uh, time just before applying the switching condition. That is the past value. Okay. So that's how you can find it out, and then you can take the inverse Laplace of the thing, and then you will be able to get the same answer. Now you can cross verify in both the case. You will ultimately get the same solutions. Okay, UFT is representing the DC magnet. So don't be confused about it. Some more uh, demonstrations when you are going to switch from time domain to frequency domain, or that is time plane to S plane. Um, some different kind of uh, uh, non sinusoidal inputs like the delta function, uh, the value of transformation is equal to 1, step function. Uh, or you can say that UFT is basically representing the unit step function when the magnitude is exactly one. Step can have any magnitude. It can be one, two, half, three. But unit step that means it is a there is a suddenly change in magnitude. Uh, okay. So for example, zero to one. So when it, you are jumping, there is a step. That means rate of change is infinite. Okay. So very very difficult to achieve. So practically, a step function you can see, or with the help of MATLAB you can realize, you can plot it, you can control the rate of change. But ultimately the step function is a practically a signal which attends change in magnitude with no time. Okay, so that is one by s. T is a ramp function. It is one by s square. Okay, similarly you can attend any anyth order of 
uh, t uh, volume of signal or a function in the time domain so it's an equivalent frequency domain will be 1 upon s raised to n for any order of n minus 1 e raised to at exponentially rising function it is 1 upon s minus a e raised to minus at so it is exponentially reducing function it is 1 upon s plus a okay t into u raised to my at that means 2 exponentially rising and the ram function both are multiplied so it is 1 upon s minus a raised to 2 so therefore for any th order of n minus 1 you will get 1 upon s raised to sorry 1 upon s minus a raised to n similarly uh, for the different kind of the signals you can work it out it's a mathematical model and you can take the laplace uh, transformation and you can work out the equivalent uh, frequency domain uh, magnitude of the signal okay so as an example um, all the properties uh, which is applicable in your time domain auxiliary equation is also applicable here you can uh, have the linearity you can take, take uh, time differentiation you can take the time integration you can have a summation uh, product of the two signals that is the product of two signals is that you working out in the convolution remember okay so there is no as such um, uh, what you call uh, if, if say for example there are two function f1 and f2 which are multiply in the time domain they will not reciprocally multiply in the frequency domain it is going to be integrated with one of the domain with its time delay property okay which is called the convolutions Okay, we will see at the little later. So that's how you can apply the Laplace transformation and you can find out the same solution. For example, the RC network or RL network we have been considered in the two, almost two lectures before when we discussed uh, so we initiated our discussions over the time response analysis. And you can say that I appreciate that you are getting the same solution with the lesser number of steps. That's the beauty of the frequency domain. So sometime if the analysis is consuming much more number of steps that means the analysis consuming more time to get respond in time domain so the uh, smarter approach is that intelligent approach is that you switch that analysis into frequency domain so you will be analyze the system with no time okay so as good as you can delay uh, you can avoid the any delaying in the response so that's how depending on your application sometimes we used to uh, switch from the time domain to frequency domain or from frequency domain to time domain but remember one thing whenever you are analyzing in only in time domain your frequency domain information is lost whenever you are analyzing in frequency domain your time domain information is lost so you are compromising with one of the domains so it depends on your application that in which domain you should analyze the things okay? get the faster response as we discussed in the previous slide about the convolutions here let's say we consider the two functions f1 and f2 and it's a frequency domain representation is f1 of s and f2 s so what we have meant we are considering a delay time of the tau time period whereas tau is much much lesser than the total time period of operation t okay we are adopting one delay function in one of the domain okay and then how would you going to justify so let us see the graphical pattern so if one function is raising at time t is equal to 0 as f1 t is indicated and f2 t is indicating at t minus tau so if you see the convolution property it is f1 tau into f2 tau in our demonstration we have taken into f1 t minus tau or you can take f1 tau into f2 t minus tau d tau okay between 0 to t so convolution says that uh, you are going to multiply the two signal you can achieve the response of the product of the two signals if you are going to considering in the frequency domain with the integration between the two boundary point okay with uh, consider conditionally uh, you are accepting a con a uh, reasonable but the uh, calculative amount of delay negligible but the calculative amount of delay with one of the function okay so if you are going to plot this and that's how you can see the response of the particular signal if it is a product of the systems okay two step functions okay so what you are getting you are getting a theoretically you are getting a square or rectangle so that's how you can uh, calculate uh, okay, you can convolute the different kind of responses like in this case we have demonstrated e raised to minus tau so ultimate response what you are getting it is 1 minus e raised to minus tau so 1 is the dc value okay minus of e raised to minus tau so you can plot that particular response. it's a very interesting thing i think i would advise you that you should plot these kind of response you should or you program have a small small program adopt the matlab and uh, uh, that is a very beautiful mathematical tool and you can analyze 
the different kind of patterns it will help you to develop a better understanding okay like some of the ideas you can get from the book of the ball study as well or any other books okay similarly the next question is relevant when your supply voltage is a type of a t on and t off function and both the on off functions are going to control with our reasonable amount of a time period with calculated amount of time period okay so there is a change in magnitude there is a staircase function okay so what kind of response your source input you are getting 1 upon s e raised to minus g s st okay so i hope that you able to uh, appreciate the things that when we should apply for the in today's uh, discussion uh, we have been able to conclude that what is the advantage of if you are going to refer the higher order of the characteristic equation that is in place of first order what if you are going to achieve the higher order what advantage you will get what disadvantage you will get in terms of the uh, injecting the non linearity into the system okay and at the same time we discuss the four different modes of the damping uh as far as the any second order auxiliary equation is concerned under damped condition over damped con condition uh, critically damped condition and undamped condition and its application over it and then uh, we also discuss the convolution property laplace transformation okay why we should consider laplace transformation as far as the network theory is concerned why not fourier transformation and then finally we also see some other non sinusoidal type of uh, inputs uh, what kind of uh, uh input signal you are supposed to feed or response you can attend if you are going to switching from time domain to frequency domain or vice versa so with this uh, we are going to end up and uh, end wind up our discussions uh, as far as the transient response are concerned but still uh, i'm uh, i left you with uh, some additional contents like the wave synthesis so wave synthesis is nothing but it is a characterization of the input signals okay like the different kind of patterns are given that how you can generate these patterns or how you can attend these kind of patterns or how you can use these patterns to control or analyze your given electrical white box that means your electrical network and you can use these as a input source so, so these things you can ramp up and you will be able to appreciate it if you can find any difficulty so obviously in the next lecture uh, we can discuss more little bit about the wave synthesis so wave synthesis means what basically you synthesizing the wave input wave or you are segregating in the different pattern why you are segregating in a part by part so that you will be able to understand in a better way that how the input signal is going to affect okay or impact over the given network or the available electrical or electronic network okay so with this i am concluding this discussion and in the next class uh, we are now jumping to the next module that is the two port analysis so we will initially have a discussion about the network functions okay and the um, impedance function that is the two port network and, uh, and then we will initiate our uh, continue our technical discussion under the head of the module 2 that is the two port network so this thank you